ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. Secretary Austin will begin with some brief comments, followed by General Milley. I will call on the reporters, uh, and uh, due to time constraints, I would ask you to please limit your follow-ups. With that, I turn it over to <coughs> Secretary Austin. Well, thanks, Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We've just concluded our ninth meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. I'd like to thank Ukrainian Minister of Defense Reznikov and his team for once again joining us today. Now, next week the world will mark a grim milestone. It will have been a year since Russia invaded its peaceful neighbor, Ukraine. Our hearts are with the families of all the Ukrainian soldiers killed and wounded, fighting to defend their country, their sovereignty, and their fellow citizens. And we mourn alongside the Ukrainian, Ukrainian civilians who have lost children and parents and loved ones as Russia has deliberately attacked civilian targets. Russia has inflicted a year of tragedy and terror on Ukraine. But the people of Ukraine have inspired the world. We deeply admire the resilience of the Ukrainian people and their determination to defend their territory, their sovereignty, and their freedom. And nations of goodwill have rallied together to reject Putin's vision of world chaos of a world of chaos where tyrants can trample borders and conquer their peaceful neighbors and break the rules of war. And that's what this contact group represents. Together we have made clear that we will support Ukraine's self-defense for the long haul. And we will move out with the urgency that the moment demands. Earlier this month, the United States announced another round of security assistance for Ukraine. The presidential drawdown announcement included more ammunition for HIMARS. It included 190 heavy, mach heavy machine guns to counter unmanned aerial systems from Russia or, or, or Iran, 181 MRAP vehicles, and more than 2,000 anti-tank munitions and other key capabilities. We also added $1.75 billion in Ukraine security assistance initiative funds for critical air defense capabilities, including counter UAS, UAS systems and more. And at today's contact group, we joined again with our valued allies and partners to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs when it needs it. <clears throat> And we continue to work together to provide Ukraine with full combat credible capabilities and not just equipment. And that's why we discuss synchronizing our donations into an integrated training plan. And you can see the importance of our coordination and our common efforts to meet Ukraine's needs for armor. Among the members of this contact group, we have given Ukraine's defenders more than eight combat brigades. This includes major contributions from the United States of Strikers and Bradleys and Abrams tanks. It includes the UK's donation of Challenger tanks and the contribution of Senator armed personnel, armored personnel carriers that Canada announced last month. It also includes the refurbished T-72 tanks that the United States, the Netherlands, and the Czech Republic are in the process of delivering, as well as Poland's latest donation of T-72s. And it includes the important steps from Germany, Poland, Canada, Portugal, Spain, Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands on Leopard battle tanks. Now, we also heard today about significant new air defense donations. That includes Italy and France, which jointly announced that they will provide Ukraine with a SAMP-T air defense system. 
France also announced that it will work with Australia to ramp up 155 millimeter ammunition production to support Ukraine. And finally, let me also thank Norway, which just announced that it will provide 7.5 billion euros in military and civilian assistance to Ukraine over the coming five years. And that's a very significant commitment. Now, all of these capabilities will continue to be important for Ukraine's success on the battlefield. But as I said last month in Ramstein, this isn't about one single capability. It's about delivering all the capabilities that we promise. It's about integrating all of these systems together. And it's about working with the Ukrainians to help them fight for their freedom. Now, we also had an important discussion today on our ongoing work on accountability. It's a priority for me and my contact group colleagues to ensure that our donations continue to be used as intended and that we move proactively to prevent arms proliferation. And we will keep working with our Ukrainian partners to ensure that all of the equipment that we're providing continues to reach the brave troops on the front lines. Now, a year ago, Putin assumed that Ukraine was an easy target. Putin assumed that Kyiv would easily fall. And Putin assumed that the world would stand by. But the Kremlin was wrong on every count. Over the past year, Ukraine soldiers have fought valiantly for their country. Ukraine's people have shown deep courage in the face of Russian cruelty. And countries of goodwill have rallied to defend an open order of rules and rights. Together we seek a world where disputes are resolved peacefully, where sovereignty is respected, where borders are honored, and where civilians are protected. Those are the values of this contact group. We stand united in our support for Ukraine's fight for freedom, and we will stand together united and resolute for as long as it takes. And with that, let me turn it over to General Milley. Thank you, Secretary Austin, and uh, thank you for your leadership uh, leading this uh, ninth uh, successive uh, contact group. Uh, this is an incredible level of effort uh, by many, many countries, uh, and it wouldn't be happening without the leadership of Secretary Austin. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and let me start by giving my condolences to the people of Turkey and Syria uh, with the tragic loss of life and suffering that has occurred because of the recent earthquake. Also suffering of the Ukrainian people. We are approaching the one-year anniversary of Russia's illegal invasion of a sovereign nation, the sovereign nation of Ukraine. And I want to thank the ministers of defense and the chiefs of defense that were here today representing 54 countries that continue to participate in this group. The actions of those leaders over the last year have contributed substantially with real effect on the battlefield, and they collectively have demonstrated unwavering commitment to the defense of Ukraine. And a special thank you to the Ukrainian Minister of Defense Reznikov and his deputy Chad, General Moisuk, who continue to display exceptional leadership. And my friend, General Zaluzny, who is on the battlefield every day, leading his country's defense. Ten days from now is the one-year anniversary when Russia brutally, illegally, and in a completely unprovoked way invaded the sovereign nation of Ukraine. As the Secretary just pointed out, Putin thought he could defeat Ukraine quickly, fracture the NATO alliance, and act with impunity. He was wrong. Ukraine remains free. They remain independent. NATO and this coalition has never been stronger. And Russia is now a global pariah. And the world remains inspired by Ukrainian bravery and resilience. In short, Russia has lost. They've lost strategically, operationally, and tactically and they are paying an enormous price on the battlefield. 
But until Putin ends his war of choice, the international community will continue to support Ukraine with the equipment and capabilities it needs to defend itself. Through this group, we are collectively supporting Ukraine's ability to defend its territory, protect its citizens, and liberate their occupied areas. In the face of a barbaric Russian invasion, Ukrainians remain resilient. The nation of Ukraine is united for one single purpose, to expel the Russian forces from their territory and to defend themselves. For Ukraine, this is not a war of aggression. It is a war of defense. For Russia, it is a war of aggression. The Russian military has paid tremendous costs in their war of aggression. And now they have resorted to sending conscripts and prisoners to imminent death. In recent months, the group who gather here today pledged to provide significant quantities of battlefield capabilities, tanks, air defense, and munitions. Eleven countries have pledged tanks, 22 have pledged infantry fighting vehicles, 16 pledged artillery and munitions, and nine more pledged air defense artillery. The group is focused, focused on delivering the capabilities committed and efficiently providing the training, the spare parts, the sustainment logistics necessary for the full employment of these systems. Training, maintaining, and sustaining Ukraine's remains key for Ukraine to prevail. Throughout this war, Ukraine has showed incredible resourcefulness in how they integrate varied capabilities to adapt to the changing dynamics of this battlefield. The Ukrainians have combined unbreakable will with innovative tactics and empowered their leaders to liberate their own country. Russia, on contrast, is waging a very costly war of attrition, while Ukraine is effectively leveraging their asymmetric advantages in order to defend itself. And the most important asymmetric advantage they have is courage, resilience, and tactical skill. This war is extremely dynamic, and Ukraine today is fighting while training and evolving for future operations. Ukraine will integrate recent commitments of armored vehicles, infantry fighting vehicles, and tanks with fires to achieve the effect of synchronized ground maneuver. While Russia has waged this war for far too long, they will not outlast the Ukrainian people nor the group of allies and partners that met today. The purpose for the United States and allies, as said by our political leadership, is very simple. It's to uphold the rules-based international order, an order that rejects the idea that big, strong, powerful nations can attack other smaller countries that borders shall not change just by the use of aggressive military force. This is the very underlying founding principle of the United Nations at the end of World War II. Ukraine does not stand alone. Fifty-four countries met today to ensure that Ukraine can defend itself and the principles that guide international conduct, and those principles will be upheld. We will remain a unified coalition we will continue to uphold the values of sovereignty and freedom, and we will continue to support Ukraine. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Tarakov, AP. Secretary Austin, um, you said earlier this is a crucial moment for Ukraine and that the Allies need to get air defenses and munitions into Ukraine now. What are you seeing from Russia that makes this moment different? And the NATO Secretary General has already warned that Ukraine is burning through munitions faster than a rate that the Allies can supply it. Will you at some point need to ask Ukraine to do more with less? And then for Chairman Milley, did one of the missiles fired at the Lake Huron object miss? And if so, what happened to that missile? And if so, does that change your risk calculus for shooting down objects over U.S. soil? Are you starting to develop alternatives uh, if, if and when you detect the next object? So in terms of where we are, thanks, Tara. In terms of where we are in the fight, uh, what we see, what we've seen over the last several months uh, is a contested battlefield. Uh, we see a lot of activity uh, in uh, in the Bakhmut area, which is where Russia is uh, is focusing most of its effort. We see Russia uh, 
introducing a number of uh, new troops to the battlefield. Many of those troops are uh, ill-trained and, and, uh, and ill-equipped. Uh, and so uh, their casualty rate has been really high. Um, <clears throat> what Ukraine wants to do in the, you know, at, at the first possible moment is to establish uh, or create uh, a momentum uh, and, uh, and, and establish uh, conditions on a battlefield that uh, continue to be in its favor. Uh, and so well, we expect to see them uh, conduct an offensive uh, sometime in the spring. And because of that, you know, we are, we, all of the partners in the, in the Ukraine Defense Contact Group have been working hard to ensure that they have uh, the armored capability, uh, the fires, the sustainment to be able to be effective in creating the effects on the battlefield that they want to create. Uh, and so um, we believe that there will be a window of opportunity uh, for, for them to exercise initiative and, and then uh, change uh, or continue to, to uh, create the, the right conditions on the battlefield there. In terms of munitions, uh, it, this has been a tough fight throughout. And we've been, uh, Ukraine has been at this for a year. And so they have used a lot of artillery uh, ammunition. Uh, we're going to do everything we can working with our international partners to ensure that uh, we give them as much uh, ammunition as quickly as, as possible and that uh, we'll, we'll do everything we can to sustain our efforts there as well. Um, we are working to, uh, w with the Ukrainian soldiers in various places throughout Europe uh, to emphasize additional training on maneuver so that uh, it, as they place more emphasis on uh, maneuver and, sh and shaping the battlefield with fires and then maneuvering, uh, there's a good chance that they'll require less, uh, less uh, artillery munitions, but that's left to be seen. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure that they have what they need to be successful, uh, and that's what we continue to emphasize here in the Ukraine Def Defense Contact Group. Uh, and, uh, and we think uh, the training will pay uh, additional dividends as well. So, so Tara, on the uh, uh, balloon shot, uh, yes, uh, first shot missed uh, on the fourth balloon. So uh, we're talking about the balloon that was uh, downed over Lake Huron. Uh, the, the first balloon, the Chinese spy balloon uh, that went down over the Atlantic on the South Carolina coast, that was that shot hit. Uh, the second one over uh, Alaska on the north coast of Alaska, that one hit. Uh, the third one in, that landed in the Yukon, that one hit. Uh, on the fourth one over Lake Huron, first shot missed, uh, second shot hit. Uh, so the, the most important thing for the American military is to protect the American people. Uh, so we evaluate the risk. We evaluate the risk of the balloons themselves. Are they a kinetic threat or not? Yes, no. Um, are they an intelligence threat? Are they a threat to civil aviation? All those things we go through very, very carefully. Uh, we determine what the debris field is likely to be uh, with one of these uh, platforms uh, landing on the Earth's surface or in the water. So we go to great lengths to make sure that the airspace is clear and the backdrop is clear uh, out to the max effective range of the missile. Uh, and in this case, the, missiles, uh, land, or the missile uh, landed harmlessly in the water of Lake Huron. Uh, we, so we tracked it all the way down. Uh, and we made sure that the airspace was clear of any commercial or civilian or recreational traffic. We do the same thing for the maritime space. Uh, so we're very, very deliberate in our planning. Uh, NORTHCOM uh, does that uh, along with the, the pilots themselves. Uh, so we're very, very careful to make sure that those shots are, in fact, safe. And that's the guidance from the president. Uh, shoot it down to make sure we minimize collateral damage and we preserve the safety of the American people. And just a quick clarifier, are you confirming that the other three objects were also balloons like the first one? I'll just use the word object. That's what everyone's using. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We don't, we don't have them recovered yet, as you know. Uh, number two, three, and four are not recovered yet. Uh, number one, we are recovering and uh, getting a lot of uh, stuff off that. But... Uh, two, three, and four not yet recovered. They're in very difficult terrain. Uh, the, the second one off the coast of Alaska is uh, that's up in, uh, in in some really, really difficult terrain in the Arctic Circle, uh, with very, very low temperatures in the minus 40s. Uh, the second one is in uh, the color in the uh, Canadian Rockies in Yukon. Very difficult to get that one. And the third one is in uh, uh, in Lake Huron at, at probably a couple hundred feet depth. So uh, we'll get them eventually, but it's going to take some time to recover those. Okay, right, let's go to Dimitro. You perform. 
Thank you for your floor. National News Agency of Ukraine, Dmitry Shkurko. Uh, to uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, was uh, the question of the plane supplies, I mean combat jet supplies to Ukraine, was discussed or not? And uh, what kind of security circumstances should be created inside Ukraine to deploy a new type of uh, aircrafts of such kind? Uh, does it mean that uh, uh, that is possible after the uh, integrated air defense system is created? And uh, to General Mealy, if I may, uh, what is your risk assessment for supply routes uh, of uh, the delivery of uh, Western equipment and uh, ammunition uh, to Ukraine and how it could be made uh, more secure? Thank you. So on the issue of uh, aircraft, uh, I don't have any announcements to make on aircraft today. Um, we're going to continue to work with Ukraine to address uh, Ukraine's most pressing needs. Again, you know, they're contemplating an, an offensive uh, in, uh, in the spring, and that's just weeks away. Uh, and so we have a lot to get done. So if you think about the numbers of systems that we're bringing together, Bradleys, uh, Strikers, uh, Martyrs, uh, CV-90s, 113s, um, uh, artillery, and the list goes on and on. It's a monumental task to bring all those systems together, uh, get the troops trained on those platforms, and make sure we have sustainment for, that, for, for all of those systems and get those systems into the fight. So that's, that's really the focus of our, our, of our conversation today. So, Demetrio, lines of communication in, in warfare and combat are always subject to enemy attack. No, no different here. Um, and the lines of communication that stretch through uh, the western portions of Ukraine are subject to Russian attack, attack from the air, attack from artillery, attack from special operations forces, et cetera. So the key uh, to ensure that the, the supplies get through, maintain good operational security, uh, vary your times, don't set patterns, take different routes, uh, and make sure you disperse uh, your force so that you have small penny packets as opposed to one large massive convoy. Uh, the security from the Polish border or any other border, Romanian border, anywhere, uh, that security is uh, part of the uh, security plan for the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, they, t they pick the stuff up and they do that. And they, they practice all the good tactics, techniques, and procedures that I just described. Uh, I would say it's not without risk, but it's moderate and it's been successful so far to get through. Okay. Let's go to Alicia Schwartz, Financial Times. Thank you. Um, uh, first, for uh, Secretary Austin, we've heard from Western officials that Russia's Air Force is well intact and that the Russians are preparing to launch an air campaign as its land forces are depleted. Where is Russia amassing aircraft ahead of the offensive? How soon could this begin? Has this hastened the need to provide air defense to Ukraine? And has enough assistance been provided so that Ukraine is ready to defend against it? Uh, and then for Chairman Milley, uh, does Russia have the right equipment to pose a threat to the Ukrainians and break through in the Donbass? And uh, separately but relatedly, is Ukraine going to get enough equipment and enough time and have a big enough force on the ground to be able to have a serious counteroffensive? Uh, thanks, Felicia. Um, in terms of whether or not Russia is uh, massing its aircraft for some uh, massive uh, aerial attack, we don't currently see that. We do know that Russia has uh, a substantial uh, number of aircraft in its inventory and a lot of capability left. That's why we've emphasized that, you know, we need to do everything that we can uh, to get Ukraine as much air defense capability as we possibly can. And recently, uh, you've seen us step up and offer Patriots. Uh, you've seen other countries come forward with SAMT and uh, in RST, uh, but it, it's not enough, and we're going to keep uh, pushing until we, we get more, uh, because that threat is, is out there. But again, uh, we, many countries have stepped up to the plate thus far. Our effort currently is to get this, these capabilities into country as quickly as we can, and then integrate those capabilities so we have, truly have an integrated error and missile defense capability. And I would add that uh, Ukraine's done a credible job of, uh, of intercepting a lot of the, uh, the, the rockets and missiles that have been launched by, by Russia in, the, in those recent attacks. But again, 
we want to make sure that they have the ability to protect themselves uh, going forward in the event that Russia tries to introduce uh, its air, air force into this fight. They haven't done so thus far because Ukraine's uh, air defenses have been pretty gosh darn effective, as you know. So, Felicia, on, on, on whether or not the Russians have the capability and equipment, et cetera, to, con uh, to continue the attack in the Donbass, uh, they are attacking in the Donbass right now. Um, their progress is slow. It's a war of attrition. They're taking heavy casualties. Uh, their leadership and morale is not great, um, and they're struggling mightily. However, uh, they do have numbers. Uh, and, and as you know, uh, President Putin did a call up of uh, several hundred thousand, uh, and those uh, folks have uh, been arriving on the battlefield. So they do have uh, numbers. <clears throat> and whether or not they're successful in pressing the fight, uh, that remains to be seen. But that fight has been going on, uh, and it's a slow, grinding battle of attrition in that, in that general area. Uh, for the Ukrainians, I don't want to project forward what the Ukrainians may or may not do. Uh, as you know from this uh, particular conference here, uh, we are uh, uh, plussing up with a significant amount of uh, capabilities uh, with ground maneuver, artillery, etc. Uh, what they do with that, uh, that'll be up to the Ukrainians in the, in the coming weeks and months. We have time for one more. Let's go to Marcus Price, ARD Television. Thank you very much. Uh, one question to Secretary Austin uh, about the stance of the U.S. when it comes to delivery of uh, fighter jets. And the, President Biden said no to the delivery of F-16. Also earlier in the conflict, uh, when Poland uh, offered to deliver MiG-29 via Rammstein to Ukraine, I think the U.S. stopped it. Has this position uh, evolved? Uh, do you uh, encourage countries to do so if they want to, or do you assess the risk is too high? So what is the U.S. position on other countries delivering fighter jets? And to Chairman Milley, um, the Russian offensive we're seeing what do you see so far? Is this very serious? Is it different than what we saw in the past? And do you have any intelligence uh, whether we, see in, we are going to see another attempt of uh, the Russian forces to capture Kiev? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Marcus. For the record, um, with respect to uh, any kind of aircraft being provided by Poland, the United States never stopped Poland from, do, from providing anything. Uh, a decision to provide something uh, is uh, is uh, that's the you know the uh, decision made that that will be a decision made by the leadership of that country. That's certainly not something that we can or will dictate. Uh, in terms of whether or not uh, we're going to provide uh, F-16s, as I said uh, earlier, I don't have any announcements to make, and I don't have anything to uh, to add to. Uh, what, what our president said uh, earlier. So, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So. And, uh, Marcus, on the uh, issue of the uh, Russian offensive, this, this offensive that you see ongoing right now in the Bak, generally in the Bakhmut uh, area, uh, you know, from, from Kharkiv all the way down uh, to Kyrgyzstan, the front line is quite stable, even though very violent, a lot of fighting, it's relatively stable. Most of the uh, dynamic movement back and forth is in generally in the vicinity of Bakhmut. Uh, the Ukrainians are holding. Uh, they're fighting the defense. The Russians, uh, primarily the Wagner group, are attacking. But there's a, what, what I would describe it as is a, a really uh, a, a very significant grinding battle of attrition with very high casualties, especially on the Russian side. Um, there, there's no fancy uh, arts of maneuver going on here. This is frontal attacks, wave attacks, lots of artillery uh, with extremely high levels of casualties. Uh, in that particular area. Uh, and how long that will last um, is difficult to say, actually. It's been going on for weeks, uh, and I think it'll uh, continue to go on uh, until, the, uh, until the, either the Russians culminate. Uh, I don't think the U Ukrainians will just collapse or fold. I think they're going to continue to fight. So uh, that, that's a battle worth uh, that we're paying attention to very, very closely and making sure that the Ukrainians have the capability to continue to defend. As far as Kyiv, uh, I'm not going to go into what intelligence we have or don't have. I would just say that uh, right now uh, there's always a potential threat. There's clearly air threats, uh, missile attack threats. Kyiv is the capital, uh, and that was a significant objective early in the war. So I would never discount uh, Russian uh, capabilities uh, to attack Kyiv, but right now we're not seeing any significant indicators and warnings. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have available today. This concludes our press briefing.